Welcome to the Strategy Mob Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me in another episode of Strategy with Jason. Today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Josh Letsis. We just got talking off camera. Yeah, That's yeah. One, you have one of those last names, man, right? Just like you were yeah. saying your son is being called Lettuce right now? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you pretty much any way you can possibly think about it, I've heard it. I just answer now. I mean, I, I don't even correct people anymore. So <laughs> I know what they're cool. trying. <laughs> hey, Josh, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to jam with me today, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. No, thanks for having me. This is awesome. Hey, for everybody out there that's watching and listening right now and kind of don't know how you got started in the industry and kind of what you're, what you're doing now, if we can kind of get that two-minute origin story that is Josh, um, that will be yeah. a great place for us to start. Yeah, so the, uh, I used to say the Reader's Digest version, but I, I don't think many people know what Reader's Digest probably, is anymore. You say a lot of audience <laughs> probably wouldn't even know what the heck that was. <laughs> yeah, they're like, what's that? Uh, so the short version, um, I, uh, I grew up poor. I grew up uh, in a single wide trailer. Um, I started selling cars at 18 years old. Originally, it was going to be a, you know, a summer job for me. Like a lot of people in this industry, you know, you get your first five pounder and you go, wow, okay, <laughs> maybe it's not going to be a summer job. And uh, literally 20 summers, 21 summers later, I was still in retail. So I started selling cars. I, I uh, became a sales manager, finance manager, director, GSM, GM, and then became an owner um, and was a partner with John Elway at, in John Elway Chevrolet. Um, nice. My last uh, five or six years of my career. And that was great. We we're the number one Chevrolet store in Colorado. It was awesome. I loved it. But uh, I was having some, speaking of my son, some, uh, some issues with him that were requiring me to be home more. And like mm -hmm. a lot of car guys and car gals out there, uh, I was a workaholic six days a week. Um, you know, so I, you uh, I had to make a really hard decision. It was hands down the hardest decision of my entire life. And that was uh, to step away from what was my dream job. You know, you work your entire career, you know, as a salesman, you go, man, I hope one day I can be a sales manager. Then you're a sales manager, man, I hope I can get into finance and, you know, or however that path looks there. And then, you know, and then eventually you're like, man, I would love to own a store. Uh, they're very expensive. So I, uh, the realist in me said, I'll probably never own my own store, but if I could partner into a store, I think that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then you get that opportunity and you crush that opportunity. Like I said, we are the number one Chevrolet store in Colorado, uh, seven years in a row. So, um, so that was, uh, that was a really tough decision, but I did it, walked away from it, had a blast with my son all summer. And then, um, said, what can I do where I'm still involved in the car business? It's all I've ever done, right? Since mm -hmm. I was 18 years old. So, uh, and I love closing deals. I love helping salespeople. I just love everything about the business. And, um, and so I said, you know what, let me do this. Let me think about some things that I can help with the car business. And, uh, and training was one of them. Um, because I feel like a lot of dealerships see the value in training, but, uh, as your day goes on, I mean, here's a typical day of a sales manager, right? He goes in, he goes, okay, I'm going to get some training done today. Yeah. And well, I got to praise a trade that showed up last night. Okay, great. I've got some heat over on the service drive. And then oh, Susie wants to blow out. I got to go put her back together. And then next thing you know, you go, oh, shoot, it's four o'clock. I didn't get training done. Uh, so I think everybody sees the value in it. It's just mm -hmm. hard to find the time to do it because it's such a disruption in the day. And so um, I said, I think I can help with that. So put together a, a training platform. Um, and I partnered with a guy named Eric Thomas. If anybody knows motivational speakers, he's, uh, if you Eric's Google number cool one guy. motivational yep. speaker yep. in the world, Very yeah, cool. he, uh, he's the guy who pops up. So he's a friend of mine. I said, E, I think people, salespeople lack two things. One is training. I can help with that. And the second is motivation because you help with that. So he added some motivation and personal development to our uh, content. And obviously I, I did the sales training stuff and uh, we launched in, in May of 2019, and and here I am now. It's just been a total ride since then, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's been fun. I mean, obviously, I love being in the dealership and um, you know being around the yeah. deals and the customers and the chaos. I mean, I love it. Um, and so this allows me to visit some stores and that sort of thing. So I do I do enjoy that. Um, but yeah, it's been. It's been an interesting journey because now I'm on the other side of the table trying to get people you. to spend money when I was the one throwing them out. You know, I don't want to spend any more money. You know, so now <laughs> it's my job to try and try and get people to slow down and listen to me. 
Well, you know what's funny? Our story is actually pretty similar. I'm, I, I'm a dealer principal turned vendor. Uh, about five years ago, we had our third child yeah. and uh, similar, man, uh, you know, just trying to be a dad and the hours that are required for running a business like that. It was, I had to make a call, right? Um, you know, what the funny yeah. thing, and I bet you you're probably the same as me, is that we actually probably work more hours now than we did then. <laughs> um, but it, it's just the schedule is just so much different, right? Like I'll find myself, yeah. you know, between you know, between nine, you know, 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. crushing it there, you know, but, yeah. you know, I'm able to, you know, get up, you know, at five before the kids get up and start working there. And then when, yeah. you know, when they're up, I'm able to take them to, I'm take them to school or, you know, I'm yeah. home for dinner. And it's just like, it's yeah. just so much more flexible. Yeah, the flexibility is unbelievable. And that's yeah. what I, I really appreciate. I'm able to, you know, previously I was dropping my son off um, two hours before school started, drop them off at the before care program, picking yep. him up, uh, you, you know, at the aftercare program. So literally he was there from 11 hours. He was there from seven in the morning until six at night. And it's like, ah, oh, I just frustrated with that. So, so yes, yeah, I'm still working a ton, but I'm able to, to fit it in and schedule it in where it's most flexible for me. And, uh, and that part's been, been really nice and really fun. Yeah. So are, do, are you do, I actually kind of switch back and forth. Are you late nights or early mornings? Oh, both. <laughs> do you, do you? So okay. early morning though. I'm a 4 30 a.m. guy. I like to get up early. Oh, I can't do it. Um, 5 30 like, is best for me. <laughs> <laughs> my wife hates it. I had to slowly walk her down to 4 30. It's like started at 5 30 and then 5 15 and then she's like do not go into the fours. Okay. <laughs> and honey, I, 4 55 will be best for me. Okay. And then it was 4 45. So you just gradually kind of worked it down. Yeah. Yeah. And now, now I'm, I'm done there at 430. I can't go, can't go any earlier. But, but isn't it uh, yeah, nice? I, like I mean, it, it's nice to crush out a couple hours, you know, two to three hours before everybody else wakes up. Yeah. Like, I just feel like, I feel like I got like a good shift done. And then now the kids are waking up and it's like that whole day starts. So I'm with you, man. I <laughs> yeah, love there's that. no interruptions. I, yeah. I, I can't, I can't agree more. No interruptions. You can lay out some things and they go, okay, here's, you know, there's some emails and obviously you're not making phone calls that early, but you know, you're, you're doing yeah. some things that you need to get done. And then you go, okay, you know, as soon as I get the kids school, come back, here are some things I need to, to, to get, to, you know, to, to finish up. It's just, yeah, I love it. I love it. Oh, speaking early. of emails. Okay. So I had to learn this one the hard way too, because I kind of felt bad for my team that I was doing that. I was waking up early in the morning, five, five thirty, something like that. Um, and yeah. I was sending emails out. And I was like, that's not yeah. cool. Like I actually, then I had a couple of team members actually felt like they were required to actually respond to me. At the early. I'm like, no, 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 oh. no, no, no. Like I'm good. <laughs> so I figured out there's a way I can actually schedule out my emails. Schedule them. So yeah. I go, so then I can be like, if I'm, if I'm working late at night, if I'm working early in the morning, I can type, 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 type away, but then I'll schedule them to go out. So everyone thinks it's kind of, yeah. they think it's funny because at 9 a.m. all of a sudden their inboxes go bloop. Um, right, you know, at, the, at nine, the 15 zero, things, zero, right? <laughs> yeah, the 15 <laughs> things I, I sent out to them, you know, to take a look at. So, but Hey, it, it, I, I love little productivity hacks. Now, actually speaking yeah. of uh, kind of productivity, I was at NADA uh, this last week and um, you know, Josh, I think you would have been super impressed because I was, you know, uh, we've been in this okay. industry long enough to know intimately how reactive a lot of our sales managers and general managers and GSMs can be, right? And yeah. I got to be honest with you, man, walking through the floor at NADA this year, I was just insanely pleasantly surprised about what I was overhearing, you know? Um, yeah. I was watching, you know, because I love, I love listening. I don't know, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm a people person like people watcher. Like I, I know it's kind of yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. Like I will grab a coffee yeah. somewhere and I will, I will go find me a spot in a corner and I will just sit there and just watch. And I think I got a few times to do that at the NADA where it's just like, I got to watch people's demos, you know, what their body language saying, what other people were saying. But I'll, I'll tell you what I heard a lot of and I thought was really kind of cool. And I want to get your thoughts and opinions on this is I had, I was watching dealers come in um, with a plan with a strategy. Yeah. Like they were like, they would come in and say, look, Mr. Bender, mm -hmm. I got this strategy, this strategy, and this strategy, and I need to execute on this strategy. So tell me how your product is going to help or service is going to help me execute on this. And I was like going, whoa, smart, right? I'm like, yeah. this is cool. You know, it's it coming wasn't, in it with a plan. Yeah. It wasn't coming in going, 
oh, that's a shiny object. I think I'll go over there. You know, it was so. And that's us typical car guys, right? We chase, you know, the, you know, the new toy. Oh, that's the new one. I, yeah, I gotta try that. I gotta try that. Yeah. It's funny. Cause uh, I talked to probably, I don't know, five or six dealers before they went and every single one of them had a plan. Some were right. a little more structured than others, but every single one of them had identified what they wanted to work on and look at, and they knew where they were going to go. Um, you know, one of them had his whole day on an Excel spreadsheet completely, you know, outlined. That's a little OCD for me, but. Um, oh, I think it's great yeah, though. I mean, use that time, be intentful, right? Like it's oh, perfect. So efficient. I mean, yeah, it's so efficient, right? I mean, it's hands down the best way to do it. Uh, so that's impressive that, that, that you saw that too. Yeah, it was cool. And then also the language and the vendors actually started to change. So I, I, I got a feeling, I think what the overall theme in our industry is going to be kind of this year. And that's kind of what I want to get your thoughts on too is even in the vendors, uh, words, words I saw consistently used in service and product companies was crazy. Uh, productivity, accountability, and efficiency. Mm -hmm. Like these yeah. were the three words that were like consistently being used in all these demos as I was walking around and listening to about other people's products and services. Are, are you kind of getting the same feeling that we're, this is yeah. the year, like this is what we're, this is what we're looking at for this year? Yeah, I mean, efficiency, and that's not something I've been hammering on to all my clients, friends, I mean, everybody in the car business, mm -hmm. because we are, I mean, we're at a place now where we have to be efficient. There's so many other uh, people out there trying to, you know, trying to get into our backyard from the brooms and the carbonas and, you know, et cetera. If we don't get better at what we're doing from an efficiency standpoint, we're going to lose. You know, you've got to, mm -hmm. just from a time from a profitability. I mean, you've got to be more efficient in absolutely everything that you do. And if you're not, and historically car dealers, we have not, right? We've made good money. And especially when times are good, we're not super efficient. Um, so you've got to nail that efficiency down and productivity, I think ties right in there too. Yeah. Um, because if you don't, you're just, you're going to lose. I mean, that's all there is to it. And the next, you know, the last 10 years have been really interesting. I think the next five years are going to be even more interesting. Yep. And, uh, and it'll be fun to see, you know, as the stars starts to level off or maybe even dip a little bit, um, you know, all of us have, have lived through, you know, a drop. You know, I don't think we're going to have anything like that. Um, but who really steps up their game and goes, okay, you know, margins are now compressed. I've got to be more efficient with the, you know, expense side of everything or, or, you know, the, the flow through the shop from a recon process, you've got a 60 day turn or, or, you know, or whatever it is, you know, you've got to be become quicker, better, faster, stronger at everything you do. No, I'm with you hundred percent. You know, what I actually think it's kind of funny is that, you know, if you actually look at our industry and you look at the last 30 to 50 years, this is actually pretty common for us. You know, we, we will almost consistently run, you know, uh, around a seven year prosperity period uh, where yeah. it's just like it, it, cause I always thought it was kind of weird. And then look at the last five, uh, last six to seven years. I mean, the fact that manufacturers like quarter after quarter, after quarter, after quarter, we're just showing increases. It's like, man, this is the roof's going to hit, right? You know, last year we plateaued out this year, we're going to plateau out. And I think probably for the next year or so we'll plateau out, but it, it, that's always kind of been the case. We usually have about six, five to seven years of prosperity. Then we plateau out another five to seven years of prosperity, then plateau out. Now the whole big recession thing, that was, uh, that, that was very different. That was a big drop. Yeah. But if it, consistently, that's always been the case for us for the last 30 to 50 years. So mm -hmm. when we're thinking of efficiencies, all right, um, I, I'm thinking when, when I think of efficiency, I think of two big places within my dealership, right? It's the mm -hmm. people and mm -hmm. things in which I'm using but it's usually kind of one of the same, right? Cause it's, it's how the people are using the systems that I'm paying for But let's talk about people first. You know, if, if a dealership yep. was come to say, come to you and say, Hey Josh, um, I want to be more efficient with my people. All right. What, what kind of advice would you give them? How would you start? So, yeah. So one of the things I've really been preaching the last, uh, well, actually, I mean, I really all throughout my career, but the last couple of years mm -hmm. more so um, is assessments and getting to know, who your people are from a personality assessment standpoint. And there's a whole bunch of them, obviously Myers-Briggs, DIF, Predictive Index, et cetera. Um, I obviously, you know, got one that I prefer. Um, but when you figure out how to effectively communicate with your staff, it is a world of difference. And we haven't done that in the yeah. past. In the past, it was, you know, you hire some salespeople. All right, get out there. You know, the strong survive. <laughs> Everybody else is gone. And we'll just keep moving. Well, now that unemployment is at effectively zero, uh, you can't do that. 
And I hear so many managers, CSM, CM, CEO principals going, I just don't know how to motivate these new younger salespeople. They don't seem to be be motivated by money, which is probably accurate. Um, And one of the assessments that I use is the motivating factors for people. There's seven different motivating factors. And uh, it's actually the same assessment Tony Robbins uses when he coaches heads of state and apparently Conor McGregor now and and all that stuff. Uh, So it's it's tried and true. Um, But it's interesting when you pull this, and uh, one of the motivating factors is economics, and that would be money, competition, that sort of thing, which is what you would think that your typical salesperson is motivated by. When well, I started the industry, that's what it was. Of, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. What I'm seeing a lot of now is it's shifting to altruism. They're actually mm-hmm. motivated by helping people. And you go, wow, how can a car salesman, how does that even make any sense? Well, you know, they may have just happened into the job. It may be a job to them, not a career. But either way, we want to get the most out of them. And the happier they are, the happier their customers are going to be. So we just have to serve up a message. And rather than talking to them about bonuses and commissions, we've got to talk to them about, hey, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones, she's going to trade in her car. Her tires are bald. Her registration's up. She's at a terrible interest rate. We can get her a better interest rate, new car, more reliable, blah, blah, blah. Go down that path. We're going to be helping Mrs. Jones if we sell her a car. Now, all of a sudden, whoa, you're talking their language, right? And the money is going to be a byproduct of their success. But if we can learn to talk in a language uh, that is familiar to them, um, that's going to be the way to do it. Now, the hard part is, as management team, we've got to learn to talk in, you know, four or five different languages, as opposed to just one blunt object that we're used to communicating with, because that's not going to work anymore. So that's going to be the difficult for us old car dogs to learn is, okay, I need to get better in tune with my people so that I can effectively communicate with them better. Hopefully we'll reduce reduce turnover. Um, Hopefully we'll increase ESI, employee satisfaction. Mm -hmm. I used to always say if ESI is high, CSI will be high. So that's going to be, it's one of those things that's much easier said than done, but we've got to learn how to do it if we want to learn to attract these newer, you know, younger people, because, you know, newsflash, they're here. We're not getting well, rid of no, them. Well, no, and that's very true, right? And, um, you know, mm-hmm. I think when I started in the industry, and probably similar when you started in the industry, look, dude, it was all about the Saturday spiffs. I mean, it was, yeah. it, it was the money, you know, it's like, um, that's how I live. Right? I, I know it's like, I told, I told the salesperson the other day, um, I said, I said, yeah, man, when I was young, dude, I, I, I did ham sandwiches all day long. And he was like, what's, what's a ham sandwich. I'm like, you don't know. Like this, I'm saying they don't even, you know, you remember that you, yeah. I remember going to my sales manager and say, Hey boss, I got a deal for you. Mm, you hungry? You hungry? Oh man, yeah. this one's good. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, you know, just <laughs> profitability coming all out all over the place. It's like a big ham sandwich. Like it's just, it's all over the place. But, um, you know, this yeah. is, again, that's not necessarily something that they care about. What I find is that they're, they're thirsty and I agree with you. They're thirsty, um, to feel connected to yeah. the business that they're working for and they want to feel connected to the their clients. They want to feel connected to their customers, yeah. right? Uh, which is yeah. really kind of interesting because, you know, then we're looking at the communication tools, you know, how are we communicating with that? You know, and yeah. I, I work with a lot of old dogs, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the funny thing is that we know how to connect. We've done it for years. Yeah. We just never did it with our employees. We just always did it with the customers who were right. walking through the door, you know, now we actually have to, and it's, it's the same kind of process. And I say, look, you know, a customer comes to the door, you want to learn their why, right? why are they buying this car? You know, what's, what, what's that motivational factor? You know, that's how we were trained when we started, but now it's the same thing with employees. Like an employee comes to work with you. All right. If we want them to embrace our why we need to know their why, like why the hell are they showing up? You know, are they paying off college debt? Are they trying to, you know, pay for their daughter's tuition? Like what's their why? It's one of the biggest problems out there. And it's, uh, you know, it's systemic. It's been around for generations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was explaining this to a dealer last night, actually on the phone. He's frustrated. I'm, you know, with his staff and he is big on his reviews. He's got, you know, a thousand Google reviews. He's a 4.8 star. I mean, he just, he'll cut somebody down if they get a bad review. He'll call somebody up personally to try and get them to flip their, I mean, he is all about his customer (laughs) satisfaction. I said, imagine if you took that same level of intensity with your employees. If you treated your employees like you wanted to make them as happy as you make your customers imagine what would happen all of a sudden i mean a light switch just flipped because he was so intense with his customer satisfaction Focusing on the customer. and yep. yeah and the employee was just a byproduct i mean you know just it's like or just an afterthought sorry and uh and i said let's let's switch that around a little bit because if you have super happy employees you're gonna have super happy customers that's just all there is to it but well, if you 100%. focus on your customer on your employees then all of a sudden your turnover is going to go down 
profitability will go up. People stop showing up late. You know, I mean, it's just all this good stuff happens that you're currently frustrated with. Well, I think like everybody understands that the customer experience is incredibly important, right? But I hate the word though, because it's been used kind of like as a buzz term. It's like, well, do you have a customer experience? Well, sure I do. I got massage chairs. Uh, Do you have a customer service? Absolutely. I got a coffee shop in my dealership. That's not really what we're talking about, right? Um, But I do love the word experience. In fact, it's the most commonly used word. You were talking about Google reviews. It's the most commonly used word in Google reviews for automotive industry across the board because it goes both ways. Um, It can be a great experience. It can be a bad experience. Um, But what I find is that great experience, that bad experience starts with the people. You know, they, they, they they may, they may come in and not like the product because I don't know, the car's too small and they're six foot two, but, yeah. If the experience with the people were great, you know, it, it, it still works out and then they still walk away having, having a great experience. So let's talk a little bit then about how we train, develop and coach these people because we know that is the key to providing an experience for our customer. You know, um, yeah. I think for years we've done a decent job of training on the activities required to do a deal. Um, yeah. But I, I think there's a slightly different approach to it now because the employee is not necessarily focused as much on the transaction as they're focused on making the connection and completing the transaction through that connection. So walk me through a little yeah, bit and when the, you're the training. Transactions are so different, right? I mean, yeah. the consumer for, I mean, if it's at 1.2 stores, right? Or 1.1, whatever the data is. Know, something like that, Versus right? Yeah. Four or five, six stores that they used to have to visit right you used to yep. you'd go to auto mile wherever that is and you'd go visit four or five stores and then a salesperson oh i pray that i'm the last store and that was uh you know that's just the way that it worked now consumers are so educated um they have you know for the longest time uh the dealer body we controlled all the information i knew yep. what interest rates were you maybe kind of knew but i really knew <laughs> i knew what your trade was worth you thought you knew but i really knew I knew what rebates were, what incentives were. I knew what invoice true cost was. I knew, I knew all this stuff. And then, the, you know, I think Al Gore invented the internet in 97, right? So I think- <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that's when he took credit right for that, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Right about then is all of a sudden, people started to get more and more information. In the last decade or so, it's just been so prevalent that the consumer controls the process. And yes. most dealers, as a salesperson, I was always taught control, control, control right? You wanted to control the customer. You wanted to control the process. And now if we continue to do that, to try and control the customer, control the process, we're going to lose because somebody else is going to do it their way. So if we're not willing to mold to them and do it their way, now I always tell the customer, you know, there's an easy way and there's a hard way to do it. I'll do it any way you want. Um, (laughs) Here's what I recommend. But if you want to do it this way and, you know, backwards and upside down, it's totally fine because I know that if I don't do it that way, Somebody in town is willing to do it. You know, in Denver, there's 10 Chevrolet stores, and I'm sure every metropolitan point. area, it's, it's real similar, you know, and they're all 20 minutes away from each other. God forbid you're in California, you could throw a football and hit, you know, three Toyota stores. Well, so it's, we're, we're uh, the same you, you way know, up here in Canada. I mean, I can literally walk from one Chrysler dealership to the next. That's unbelievable. So you've got to be competitive, and mm-hmm. it's all about the experience. And it starts with, I believe, actually, it starts with management. And I, and I hear a lot of managers go, oh, yeah, we're all about the experience. We're this and that. And then all of a sudden, the customer comes up, you know, hey, I bought my car last night and the tire pressure monitor light came on. Hey, sorry, beat it. You know, hey, your service is over there. You know, whatever it is. You know, oh, did you buy a warranty on it? No? Okay, I really can't help you. You know, so we have this lip service to our salespeople that, hey, I'm all about the customer. But then mm-hmm. when the customer comes in, now I'm all about profitability. So you've got to find that balance. Um, and I would always tell people, I treat everybody like they're my mom, my dad, my brother, and my sister. Now <clears throat> I'm not always going to bre- agree with my brother. And sometimes I'm going to want to punch true. him in the nose, but at the end of the day, if he's got a problem, I'm going to try and help him. And it may be, Hey, you know what? I'll split the bill with you. It may be, Hey, I know you didn't buy a warranty, yep. but if you did, there would have been a hundred dollar deductible. I'll take the, I mean, there's always some level of compromise. The customer's coming in expecting us to tell them to pound sand. So anything we do above and beyond that, is incredible to them from a customer service standpoint. So, um, and, and here's the thing, a little story. The bar, I'm sorry, I may be going off. No, 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 no. The, and I, hate, I hate talking when I'm sitting down too, so this is strange. Uh, but the bar for customer service is so low now. And here's the example that I tell people. Hmm. Back, uh, let's just say, I don't know, 20 years ago, so you'd pull up to a, they didn't call it a gas station. You know what they called it? Service station. The service station. Yes, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm with you. I, yep. <laughs> so you pulled up to the service station. There were those little black rubber things on the ground. Ding, ding. When you pulled up, 
two guys would run out to your car. They'd pop your hood. They'd check your fluids, oil, wash your fluids. Mm-hmm. They'd pump your gas, right? Nowadays, if you pull up to a gas station and two guys run up to your car, you're locking the doors and I'm out of here, right? So the bar for customer service is, is so low now. People don't expect much. So it's easy for us, especially in our business where they really don't expect much, it's easy for us to exceed their expectations. It doesn't cost a lot of money. And, and that's really what the customer's looking time. for. Like it's, yes, it's not enough are. that we meet the expectation. The customer's now expectation is that we exceed the expectation. And uh, I love how you put it because it's true. Like we, the bar has been lowered in some ways, in some ways it has yeah. been lowered in other ways it's been dramatically increased. Right. Yeah. So I, I would say like um, our communication efforts, right. The customer's expectations of how we communicate to them, how regularly we communicate to them, and, and when we communicate, is, that's changed. That's right this second, I want to talk Instant. to you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, but Instant. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us uh, in creating that experience to your point of like, how do we kind of just take it to that next level? You know, yeah. like, do, do, does, yeah, does it, it, does it do we have to give, I mean, I'll just give you an example. Should we really have a self serve coffee machine? Right. Should we not be getting the coffee ourselves? I actually kind of thought, cause I actually remember one of the first dealerships I worked at, they had uh, coffee at the dealership. Right. But it wasn't in a place that the uh, customer could get to it. It was back behind the corner there. Yeah. So we were forced, like it, the employees were forced to get coffee for the staff. And then I watched as a, you know, as you progress and you go into moving and work in other dealerships, stuff like that, all of a sudden the coffee, I know it's a little thing. I know it sounds weird, but it, then the coffee was just sitting out there and there yeah. was no opportunity, you know, to kind of, you know, welcome them in, sure, say hello coffee. and say, yeah. you know what, how do you take your coffee? I'll go get you one. It, that went away. Yeah. It's like the, the coffee is over there. Someone asked us, I actually watched that the other day. It happened. Yeah. I, was, I, I watched a salesperson. Someone asked, where's the coffee? And the salesperson goes, oh, right around the corner. <laughs> I hate that. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. Or where's parts? Oh, it's over there. And that's where treating everybody like your mom, your dad, your brother, sister, where yeah. if mom asks for a cup of coffee, guess what? I'm going to go get my mom a cup of coffee. If mom <laughs> asks for parts, I'm going to walk her over to parts and go, hey, mom, this is Bob. He's my favorite parts guy. He's going to take great care of you. You know, yep. versus your average salesperson goes, yeah, parts is over there, service, yeah, you got to pull around and, you know, there, and, you know, versus going, hey, you know what, why don't you just hang out right here, I'll pull your car in the service drive, and then introduce you to a service advisor. I mean, little stuff like that, that is, uh, it's so important, and most salespeople, most of them, will appreciate helping out a customer, because most of them really like helping people. Um, there's a select <laughs> few that are going to go, I don't get paid to do that, you know, it's not, you know, whatever. Um, you know, we can, we can deal with them later, but, uh, but there's a select few that are uh, most of them, sorry, that are going to be okay with going above and beyond from a service sure. aspect. And those little things, that, those are the things that customers remember. Well, it is right. Look, I, I think in our industry that if there is a big issue, all right, we're actually pretty good about identifying the big issue and then addressing it and fixing it and squashing it. Right. Um, but it's yeah. not, it's never a big thing that ultimately creates a customer experience or lack of, it's always a bunch of little things that makes that experience yeah. either negative or positive, right? So how yeah. do we train for that? Because I feel like we, me and you have probably been in the business long enough where it's like, it's just a natural thing. Josh, someone walks up to you and asks you where the coffee is, all right? You're not going to point. You're just, it's just yeah. in you. Just walk that person over. How, yeah, how do you take yeah. it? Let me grab the cup. Let me pour that for you. All right. Uh, one sugar, one cream, no problem. You know, like you, yeah. we, but that's natural for us. How do, yeah. how do we train more managers need to, It starts with management, right? So more okay. managers need to be doing that. You can't as the manager goes, say, hey, I want you as salespeople to do this, but then we don't do it as a management team. So we've got to figure out, number one, what, what's our identity? What do we want to do? Mm. What do we want to be known for? Good point, um, good point. And that's, uh, and that's where it starts, you know, tip, tip top, you know? And, uh, and it may be walking people to the coffee. It may be, you know, walking people over to parts and service. It may be, you know, when somebody comes in with a problem, we sit down and we actually talk to them about, you know, the problem and how can we resolve it and, you know, whatever it is, but it starts with some brainstorming and then go, okay, this is our culture. This is what we expect. And, uh, you talk to, you talk to them about it in the new hire orientation. You talk to them about it every single day when you're interacting with the customer, uh, because we know the salespeople are like, four-year-olds you've got to talk to them over and over and over again uh it's just human beings i guess i shouldn't single out salespeople. um but with it's that repetition over and over and over yep. to where eventually 
it just becomes the way you do business. And then, and it takes a while to ch- change the culture of a whole store, but then eventually, after a while, a lot of hard work, the culture of the store is exactly where you want it to be. And when you bring in a new salesperson, guess what? They've got to adapt to the culture versus the other way around. So I, uh, I agree that's with what you. I think. It starts with some brainstorming from, you know, from upper level management. And, and I agree and with you. you have, it has to be brainstorm up there. And actually, I had someone actually yeah. ask me this weekend when I was at NADA, Jason, what comes first? brand or culture? And I'm like, oh, well, this is an easy one. Um, I'm like, you first need to define uh, how you want to be perceived as a brand. All right. The execution of that, of how you want to be perceived actually ultimately becomes the culture. Um, So, you know, I was sitting down with the dealership and I was trying to explain to them. I said, look, you guys already have a brand. They're like, no, we don't. I'm like, no, you do. Right. Your brand, the perception of who you are as a business, your brand, it already exists in your customer's eyes. You don't get to define the brand. The customer gets to define the brand. So let's go to your Google reviews. Let's start reading. All right, let's start identifying some patterns of words that are commonly used within it, either both negative or positive. That's why I love Google reviews. Except there is one thing about yeah. Google reviews I can't understand. And I've, because I've been reviewing a lot, I read a lot of Google reviews. I don't understand somebody that leaves a three star review. In fact, it pisses right? me off. Yeah. Um, like I'm They're just not happy. <laughs> They're not upset. You're so indifferent. Like, I, mean, I understand two, I understand one, I understand four, I understand five. Makes total sense to me. But I'm like, the three-star review, what would have to be going through your head to be so indifferent that you would actually take 90 seconds out of your life to actually, sorry, I digress. I'll get off that subject. I just think it's weird <laughs> as hell. I just think it's so weird to leave a three-star review. Um, but anyways, we, we, there are words that um, our customers use to describe us, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, either it was, uh, it was fast, it was uh, easy, it was very helpful, it, it felt uh, friendly, you know, um, th- these are the words that they describe us as a brand. So you, you can easily go to your clients and say, hey, what three words would you describe us as a business, right? And that's ultimately your brand right now. But now that gives us the opportunity to decide what three words we would like them to describe us as. Then we can take those three words and say, okay, those are the three words that we want to be described as is the how we're doing business actually going to support those words? And it kind of starts building off from there. Um, The food has to match the menu. If you go to a restaurant and the menu says something and they bring it out and it ain't what the menu said, there's a problem. And that's when you're going to have to upset customers. So the food's got to match the menu. Food's got to match the menu. Actually, that's a great, (laughs) that's a great way to describe it because how many times have you been to a business or, um, you know what, actually, I just took a WestJet flight on the way back, and the food did not match the menu. Like, it just, it yeah. was not, it was, and it wasn't necessarily the food, it was just literally just the experience, right? Um, yeah. We, I, I had some points, and flying on the way back, you know, sitting next to someone like this, I was like super tight, so I was like, all right, whatever, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to upgrade, you know, this round. Yeah. I got the points, I'm going to use them, right? So we upgraded our flight back, and... Uh, yeah, the food definitely did not match the menu. It was, I guess, the airplane, uh, there was something wrong with the airplane, so they had to go, it was hilarious. They said, well, we grabbed an airplane from LA and brought it here. I'm like, was it just sitting in the back or something like that? Right. This plane Hanging looked out. like it was, it was like literally pulled right out from 1995. It? <laughs> uh, it had, the Wi-Fi was busted. There was, the TVs were busted. Like my seat literally fell apart. A chunk of the seat fell off and when I leaned on it. And I'm like, yeah, no, this totally does not match what kind of the expectation yeah. going into it is, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, and that's bad. Now you've got a sour taste in your mouth and you're going, oh, I don't know, I'm probably not going to book another flight on them again. Yeah, it, well, exactly. And, and I think that's the point <laughs> is that we, we, do, we do get one shot really for the most part. You know? Yeah, we, yeah we and here's the problem shot. with car dealers, right? We may be able to close the deal with terrible service. We do it all the time. So yes, as positive we, <laughs> we can. You close the deal with terrible service. But now it's the service department's job to really keep that customer as a member mm. of our family. But if we piss them off in sales, service may never have a crack at it. And, uh, you know, obviously retention is a big thing from the manufacturer standpoint right now. Um, you know, and I, I don't know what the data is at my store. I think we were about 60, 70%. But I've seen Toyota stores with the free Toyota care that are in the 30% retention range. And you go, it's a free oil change. You have upset them so much. They won't even come in for a free oil change. They're going to pay, you know, people talk about Jiffy Lube all the time. And I don't know when the last time you've been to Jiffy Lube, but it's like a cheap? 70 or an $80 oil change. 100%. It's not cheap. <laughs> no. You're paying for the convenience of them getting you in and out, right? 
So it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those deals. You've got to really give them quality service and then the service department, then hopefully they'll get their opportunity because we know what the data shows that they service with us frequently, they're mm-hmm. more than likely going to come back and buy from us again and that sort of thing. So, um, and if they're a repeat customer, they don't negotiate as much. They're easier to close. I mean, nothing bad happens, but it all starts with that first interaction with the guest. It does. And, and to your point, and I love it. Look, it starts from the top down. Right. You know, I think a lot of times when we think of experience, I think as a default, we just we're thinking of the sales experience. Uh, but yeah, hands yeah. down, you know, kind of what you were saying earlier about what gas stations were really called from the beginning. It, we got to put the service part back into the service department. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but it, it's training. It all comes down to training. It's, you know, I don't necessarily yeah. like if I have a bad experience at a business, you know, I think cause my brain is probably processed this way and I'm sure you probably are similar to this too, is that I don't necessarily get upset at the individual. I literally think about, you know, what was the process? What was the training yeah. this person received, you know, uh, or lack of for me to ultimately get yeah. this type of experience. Um, when you're thinking, when you're, when you're training from the top down, all right. You know, I think the key is always to be intentful with our time. So, you know, someone asked me the other day, go, Jason, like, how do I train my team? Like, I don't have time. What would you yeah. respond to that? You've got to make time for it, just like everything else. Um, and the, again, the problem with most trainings is it's a disruption in the day. It's, you know, two o'clock. Okay, everybody stop what you're doing. Let's go upstairs and we're going to train for an hour. Yeah. And it just doesn't work. You know, I mean, they're midway through their day. They got stuff rolling. Susie's got an appointment, Bobby, you know, and at service, they're like, oh my God, I got to get ready for deliveries. And I mean, it's just a pain in the butt. So that's probably the biggest trouble with training. And God forbid you hire somebody and bring somebody in from the outside. Then it's like, I don't care what you're doing. I paid for this guy to be here. Everybody stop what you're doing. And then everything stops in the store for an hour or two hours or three hours or, you know, whatever it is. So um, you, you've got to be intentional and that's kind of a buzzword too, right? You've got to be intentional with it. And it's like, Hey, here on the calendar, sometimes it means we're coming in early. We've come in early for training before we've stayed late for training before I've done training on a Sunday before, um, you know, and, and you I probably don't want to do that too much, but you just got to be super intentional with the planning for it and act like it's as, as important as you truly believe it is. Because if you truly don't believe it's important, it's not going to get done. You know, and then you're going to be six months later bitching about how, you know, your employees are pissing off your customers and oil changes take three hours and, every, you know, like people are leaving my service department and going to the independence and, you know, rather than complaining about it, you've got to be proactive. And it's not easy. It's hard work to go, okay, you know, we've got 14 hours worth of work that we have to get done in an eight hour day and I got to get some training in there somewhere. It's, well, it's, it's, it's like going it's to the gym. It's not easy, right? But if I continue to get <laughs> my ass up in the morning, go to the gym, I'm going to start seeing the results. Uh, but I agree with you, though. It, it does have a lot to do with our mindset, right? And the manager's mindset is so insanely important. I was at a dealership a few weeks back and uh, watched a sales manager kind of come out during a sales team at, just to let them know about when the next training session was. And I mean, I'm not, it literally went down like this. All right, guys. Uh, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after uh, we're going to need you guys to come in at this time. We're going to do some training. So yeah, everyone make sure that you're there. I was like, Punk. Oh man, Let's shit. Go. This sounds like yeah. fun. Woo. Sign me up. <laughs> well, I think I got a dentist appointment that day. I yeah. Know. I was like, I mean, literally the, the, just the sheer excitement on the manager's <laughs> face. I was just like, yeah. Hey guys, by the way, we got some training, but it's the same manager that's going to complain about his staff because they don't know how to do what they need to do. So, you know, we treat them like crap. We blow them out. We hire a new green pea and we don't train them either. So then the manager complains again about how, you know, it's just a perpetuating problem that is self-inflicted. You know, we, turnover is always going to be high in sales. It always is, but we can do a better job of training our staff, and then mm-hmm. if we have better trained staff, guess what? Sales managers, you don't have to bitch about how they don't know how to, you know, stock in a trade. They don't know how to, you know, whatever you know, you're training on that day because they're better trained and they've been there for a year or two years or three years and your life would be easier. Well, I find, like I said, it'd be easier, <clears throat> but we have to have that mindset that it's not that person's fault. I mean, I think you know, right. we, have to, we have to look at ourselves in the mirror first here, right? You know, it's like uh, this person boshed up this deal. This person really pissed off this service customer, whatever it is. Who's it's like, fault is it? 
yeah, whose fault is it? Is it really their fault? You know, or, you know, right. I have to be honest enough with myself to say, well, well, did I train him on what and to do when that do, happened? Right. Look in the mirror and go, man, I'm 40 pounds overweight. Whose fault is that? <laughs> well, you know what? It's, it's not the fault. food. It's hard to, yeah. <laughs> I had to chew it. Dang it. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to look yourself in the mirror and go, okay, I've lost three salespeople this month. Why? It's my fault. My fault is major. I took it so personal when anybody left me uh, because I poured into them and I truly thought everybody with me would probably one of my downfalls would stay with me for 100 years. And if somebody ever left, I took that personal. Um, but I think that's part of the reason why I, I always was working on my people was because, uh, you know, I, I just, I believed in them so much and I wanted them to believe in me, believe in our mission, you know, buy into the dealership. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult, right? Look in the mirror and go, man, that person's not doing what they need to be doing. And it's my fault. Well, I, I think it's a description. Like actually it should be in our job description as a manager, right? Like it's, it, it, it's our fault, not our employees fault. It's our fault. Now look, is there things that literally, you know, after you train and coach and train and coach yeah. and they just don't execute like, okay, you know, there comes that point in time, but I, I think that's actually pretty rare. I mean, I think probably yeah. most things can be chalked up just to a, a, a lack of training or a lack of understanding. Like, Hey, when you have this situation, this is how we should react to it. But it kind of goes back to what you were talking a little earlier about really kind of defining out the, the why, right? Like if, if we know why we're doing it, because we're trying to ensure that our customers perceive us as being fun and easy to work with, then, you know, what you're doing right now, doesn't sound really fun and it sure the hell ain't making life easy. So it's like, how do you kind yeah. of change there? But you know, I, I work with a lot of managers and you do too. How, how, how do we get our mind around that? Like, how do we maintain that mindset? So we have to try and figure out what their why is what, right? What are their frustrations? Mm -hmm. People will work harder to avoid pain. There's been a gazillion studies on this than they will to gain pleasure. So if you're talking to somebody going, hey, this will make your life easier, hey, okay, that's neat. But if you say, hey, I'm going to take this pain from you, they will work much harder for that. And that's where we've got to, when we're communicating to our managers, is identify what are their issues, you know, what motivates them, what's going on, what are their biggest hurdles in the day, and then, okay, how can I make your life easier? And what would happen, what would we need to do to fix this problem? And remember, not like going to the gym, nothing's instantaneous. It's all just a series of small improvements. And then one day you wake up and you go, oh, wow, okay, my life's a little easier now. Oh, wow, look at this. I'm a little, you know, lost a little weight. But you don't wake up after 24 hours and you go, hey, look at this. I got a six pack. That's not how it works. <laughs> and, you know, we've, we're part of that uh, society where we want instant, instant, instant results. It's just not going to work that way. So what happens to a lot of managers is they'll start training. They mm -hmm. will start doing the things that they know they need to do, but they don't get instant results. So then, ah, screw it. I just give up. And that's where, you know, that's not going to work. You've got to. And again, that'll come from their manager, GSM, dealer principal, GM, going, okay, we've got to make sure that this is implemented every day and remind the managers why we're doing it. We're doing it because we want to, uh, yep. you know, take this pain away from you of having an untrained staff. You know, if you ask any sales manager, hey, would you, if you could have a staff of, you know, people that have been doing this for five years, the right way, not, you know, a bunch of old sleazy car dogs, but the right way. And they knew everything about the store, everything about the product and knew how to explain a lease and knew how to explain rebates. Would you prefer to have that? Or would you prefer to have five salespeople we just pulled from the Verizon store that, you know, maybe okay <laughs> with people, but they have no idea what they're doing. Oh, well, I would rather have five people who know what they're doing. Of course you would, but that takes time. But time. See, that's the kicker. Time. <clears throat> like, um, Look, we're, we're in an industry that it seems like, especially for our managers and for our owners and just kind of, or even our salespeople, there's like a total lack of patience in this industry. Like, it's like we, like you were talking earlier, like we have to have like instant gratification. It's like, I went through one training session with my team. Why the hell aren't they doing it? <laughs> it's like right. one session, yeah, yeah, yeah. one time, yeah. you know, like we, we, we have to understand that training is, does not tie into your 30 day cycle. Like it, yep. it, it is a long-term strategy. Uh, I mean, typically- I tell people to take a shower. If you don't do it every day, it's just not effective. You know, if you're only showered <laughs> once a week or once a month or God forbid, <laughs> once a quarter, it's not effective. You've got to like do it that. every day. It's very true. Um, so, and, that, and, that, and, that, and that's a good point. So training every day, all right? Again, we we're yeah. talking earlier about being intentful, all right? How do, how do we do this? Do, do, do you recommend blocking something off 
you know, yeah. in the morning. So what I recommend is getting it done first thing. Get okay. it done first thing because we all know it's 10 minutes after you've been in the store, you're, it, it, it's gone to hell in a handbasket, right? So I recommend first thing in the morning um, and, and uh, you know, a couple different ways to do it. But yes, first thing in the morning, block it off. And like a shower, 15 to 20 minutes. That's, that's all I recommend, right? You don't want to get into this 20. big hour of all. Yeah, 15, 20 minutes, but every single day. And there's going to be days where you, you get on something and, you, you know, you roll out for 45 minutes, et cetera. But I don't want that to be the norm where you're training for 45 minutes to an hour every day because you're going to turn your salespeople off. They're going to be thinking about, oh, my gosh, I got a customer coming in. I got his car cleaned up and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, 15, 20 minutes, you know, like I said, there's going to be days it goes a little longer. But at a minimum, 15, 20 minutes and just knock that out every single day. Steady drip every day of training. Now, I, I know it's getting towards the end of our time, but I did have one more question about that um, because I, I've seen this happen too often that in a training session, it is literally, I, I was in one a few weeks ago and uh, this was probably close to 40, 45 minutes. I don't know if the manager actually breathed any point in time during the 45 <laughs> minute period. I think he got yeah. into it, kind of doing one of these and then just went for 45 went. minutes. Yeah. And I'm yeah, just you've watching the body language. Yeah. I'm watching the body language on the team and stuff like yeah. that. And it's like not a single word, not, not even an opportunity yeah. for them to have a word that's out. And then it was like, okay, I guys, preach. let's go. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the things I preach is you've got to get the staff involved. So what I recommend for me, I don't try to plug myself, but play one of my videos, <clears throat> talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes, have a discussion. And the discussion could like be that, that video sucks. I tried that. It doesn't work. Or, yep. you know, I forgot about that. I did that 20 years ago, whatever it is, but have a 15, 20 minute discussion because most sales managers, let's just face it. They've never been trained how to train. They've never been trained how to manage your <laughs> typical sales manager was your number one salesperson. Well, your number one salesperson is an individual. That's why he's the number one salesperson. And that's who we promote. Exactly. Probably not the best guy to promote. You want to promote <laughs> the, the guy or the gal that, you know, was, uh, could involve the whole team. But regardless, that's what we do. We promote this highly individualistic person. And they go, hey, by the way, now you're not in charge of yourself. You're in charge of 15 salespeople. And they have no idea what they're doing. No. So use whatever crutches you can use um, because, it's, again, not your fault. You've never been trained how to train. You've never been trained how to manage people. So it's not your fault. But let's use some crutches. So play a video, you know, talk about it, 10, 15 minutes, and then boom, there you go. There's your 10, 15, 20 You're minutes done. a day that you've got your training done. And you can focus it on whatever you want to focus it on. You can play whatever video you want to play. Um, you know, you could do a, a, like a book club. Everybody reads a chapter a week, and we're going to talk about it. There's so many things you can do to help mm -hmm. assist you as a manager with that training if you're like, I'm just not comfortable doing it. Well, newsflash, nine out of ten guys are not comfortable doing it. Um, so use whatever you can use to help uh, assist you in becoming better at it. But you've got to get the staff involved. You don't get the staff involved and you're just a manager up there talking about how, you know, when you sold cars, it was uphill both ways in the snow and you didn't have boots. And, <laughs> in fact, actually, I mean, I'm pretty sure I've heard that exact story a couple of times. Well, when I sold yeah. cars, like, how's that training? Yeah. But, no, I love it, man. I mean, yeah. I, I'm with you on this. Like training um, needs to be more of a conversation, <laughs> I think, for a lot of cases. You know, I, th I think having these little 15, 20 minute conversations around training. And then if you have to yeah. have more of a longer structured piece, because you got to train yeah. on a very specific and that's okay process. Too. Right. Sometimes you're like, okay, we're going to block this off. It's going to be two hours. Mm -hmm. There's times where you have longer training. You have but state of the union. Like there drip, you go. Yeah. Just that daily drip of training. And as a manager, you can focus it on what you need to focus on. And there's going to be redundancy. You're going to be super repetitive. You know, yep. but that's what training is all about. You know, I use sports <laughs> analogies all the time. The NBA guys are shooting free throws right now, right? They've been shooting free throws since they were this tall. They're still shooting free throws and they're multimillionaires. You know, yep. we've got to take that same approach as salespeople going, okay, oh, we just talked about that two weeks ago. Okay, we're going to talk about it again because that's what it takes <laughs> is that repetition, 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 repetition. Um, but yeah, you've, you've got to get them involved and it's got to be consistent. That's awesome. Hey, Josh, I know our time's up and I just want to thank you, man, so much for jamming with no, me today. Jason, this was, this was a lot yeah. of fun. Hey, for everybody that's watching right now or listening and would love to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing, what's the best way to do so? Yeah. So website is closingbig.com and uh, Facebook's probably the best way. And that's Facebook slash closing big um, or just search for it. And you'll find my page. I do a video every single day. Monday through Friday uh, with some sort of sales tip or tactic. And I put it on um, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, about eight out of 10 times it makes it to Instagram. So uh, if you want something that's free, it's right there. And it's, uh, you know, most of my videos are short. I try and keep them two to three minutes. 
so you don't have to worry about, you know, your attention span and any of that stuff. But definitely carve out time to listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> schedule it, right? If it's schedule it. Be intentful with it. it. <laughs> yeah. Josh, man, thanks again. It. This was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Have a good one. All right.